Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth, and we receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation that you're bringing forth regarding the subject of covenants. We thank you that we are learning about them, taking hold of everything the word says, being a doer of it, and seeing you bring forth what you purpose in our life. Thank you, Father, for all that you accomplished this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing you with you on the subject of covenants. We talked about what a covenant is, what it means to God, how he will never alter it, never break it. He will perform it. He swore by himself because he could swear by none greater. We talked about the fact that the covenants in the Old Testament were made with men and the seed pointing towards Christ is the fulfillment of all of them and pointing towards what Jesus brings forth as he would bring forth the New Testament. We also begin to talk about the aspects of a covenant, which is what we're talking about now. We talked about the name of the covenant, which in the Old Testament was the I am being that I am being, Je Jehovah or Rapha, the one with the Jehovah or Yahweh, the one who is the performer of his word to bring forth promises. Remember, this is the covenant keeping name of the Lord that reveals who he is, what he does. And then we see that we began to talk about aspects of more of the covenant today. We talked about the word of the covenant which is what God performs, and that's what shows the responsibilities that you have and the responsibility that God has. We also talked about the tables of the covenant. In the Old Testament, it was written on tables of stone, but in the New Testament, it's written on the tables of our heart. In the Old Testament, there was the book of the covenant. Everything was written in the book. In the New Testament, it's also written in the book, the book of the New Testament. And remember, we pointed out that this book is to have our names written in it as well, and we want to make sure we're walking in his ways because we saw those ones who were blotted out of the book. Their name was blotted out from under heaven because of the fact that they did not walk in the ways of the Lord. We also talked about the blood of the covenant, that when they obeyed the word of God and did what he told them to do, then the blood was applied by Moses, who's a type of Christ. When you and I walk in the light as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ is applied by him which continually keeps us in the state of being cleansed from all sin. We also talked about the bond of the covenant, which is a bond which is by the oath that God took. He took an oath, and this is a bond which has bound us unto walking in line with the word of the covenant. God expects us to understand that we're, we bound our soul with an oath when we entered into the covenant. And we pointed out that this is an age during covenant during the particular period of time in the ages that they were made. Also, we pointed out the fact that man is expected to keep the covenant, observe, take heed, and do what the Word says, and that the covenant is to be established. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about what it means to have the covenant established in you, which we saw it was established when they used that sword to smite all their enemies and destroy them, and when they were fruitful, and they were multiplied, and the result was that they saw the establishment of the covenant. We looked at many scriptures, in the New Testament especially, showing the fact that you and I are to come to the place of having fruit, more fruit and much fruit. We also are to be increased. We're to bound in all the things that God says continually. We're to be multiplied greatly. God desires for this work to be done and the establishment of the covenant. Well, tonight we're going to talk about other aspects of a covenant which we must understand as well. And the first one is the fact that we cannot forget the covenant of the Lord. It speaks of those who did forget the covenant of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 23, take heed unto yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God. We can't forget it. And you aren't going to forget it if you get, you know, as long as you keep your eyes on the word and doing what he says, you won't forget it. It says here, which he made with you and Make you a graven image or a likeness of anything which the Lord thy God has forbidden thee. That's what they did. They went off, they got their eyes off of what God told them to do and went off and made false images and got into idolatry. We see over in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command to this day. This shows you another way that they would forget the covenant, they would forget the Lord because they didn't keep the commandments. 
They were expected to keep the commandments in the Old Testament, and you and I are expected to keep the commandments of the New Testament, the New Testament commandments given by Jesus Christ. If we're not keeping them, then essentially we have forgot the Lord because we're not walking in His ways. We also see down in verse 14, He speaks of thine heart being lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Never forget what Jesus has done for you. He delivered you out of Satan's authority, which Pharaoh's a type of Satan. He delivered you out of bondage to the world, Egypt's a type of the world. He has brought you into relationship with him through new birth, spiritual new birth. And so you can't let your heart be lifted up. That's pride. Pride will cause you to forget the Lord. We see it time and time throughout the Word of God where they got into pride and they forgot the Lord. They went off and did their own thing. Those ones who are proud will not and in, in, be in the presence of God. They will not see God accomplish His covenant promises in their life. We see further, down in verse 19, It shall be, if thou shalt do it all, forget the Lord thy God. And what happens if you don't walk after His ways and put Him first place? You'll walk after something else will be your source. Walking after other gods. Anything else becomes a source other than the Lord becomes an idol in your life. It could be money, it could be a job, it could be things, it could be a person, it could be uh, some, some things that you like to do instead of following the way of the Lord. That's walking after other gods and serve them and worship them. He said, I testify against you this day, you shall surely perish, because the breaking of a covenant was death. And therefore, we cannot forget the Lord and walk after anything else. We see also in Psalms 119, constantly, it was spoken about how he would not forget the Word of God or forget anything of the testimonies and the statutes of the Lord. Psalms 119, verse 16, he said, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy Word. If you forget his Word, you don't delight in doing his Word, then essentially you forgot it because you're going and doing other things. We see down in verse 83, he continues to speak these things. He said, I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet I, do I not forget thy statutes. I will not forget. It doesn't matter what the situation is, whether there's anything, calamities or any problems going on in your life. You always need to keep your eyes on the Lord. Verse 93, I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. That's how he brings his life to you, through his word. His word is life unto you. Jesus wants to bring life and life more abundantly in the New Testament. Verse 109, my soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. You're in control of your soul of what you yield it to. He's given you a will. You can choose to yield to him or not. He says, I don't forget your law, otherwise I'm going to yield to doing the word. I'm going to put the word of God first place. That's what he expects of all of us. Verse 141, he said, I am small and despised, yet do I, and I do, do not I forget thy precepts. Regardless of what's happening, whatever other people think about you, it doesn't matter what goes on in your life. Always remember the word and get your eyes on the word. You can't let circumstances get you off of the word of God. That's the work of the devil to try to do that. Verse 153, consider mine affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget thy law. You keep walking in the midst of whatever it is, God will deliver you as you keep doing what He says. He will bring you out of the things that are coming against you or things that you're in the midst of dealing with. We see in verse 1676, I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. Well, we need to not forget the commandments. If we, of course, in the New Testament, we now are to follow the, sheep, the shepherd of the sheep shepherd of the, all, all of us, which is putting the word first place and being a sheep following him closely. We're not to forget the commandments of the Lord whatsoever. We see over in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Otherwise, everything that God is bringing to you, is he bringing revelation knowledge? And then as you walk in, he imparts spiritual understanding. And then you get wisdom as you're walking in it. He wants you to not ever forget it or let it go. It's to be incorporated into your lifestyle. You're to keep it before you. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Again, you're going to be following the way of the Lord. We see over in Hosea, chapter 4, 
where they did the wrong thing. He said in verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why? Because thou hast rejected knowledge. When knowledge comes to us, God expects us to take hold of it and be a doer of it. And notice what he says, I will also reject thee. You see, whatever you do with God is the way what he's going to do with you. You reject his word or you reject the knowledge of God, which is basically rejecting him, he's going to reject you. That you should be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, he says, I will forget your children. Otherwise, again, how you treat me is how I'm going to treat your family as well. I'll forget your children if you forget the law of God, which is essentially is forgetting me. Remember, God deals with you as you deal with him. You and I must put him first place and never forget the covenant, the word of God. In the New Testament, we see it speaks of about those who were forgetful. James 1.22 says, Be or become, more literally, doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Otherwise, if you're not a doer of the word, you're just hearing it, you are deceiving yourself. Why? Because it says, anybody be a hearer of the word, not a doer. He's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He beholds himself, goes his way, and straight man way forgets what manner of man he was. Without doing the word, it will not get incorporated into your lifestyle, and therefore you will forget the word. Whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty, the Word of God, and continues therein, this is what he walks after, abides in, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in his deed or in his doing. This really speaks up. Notice, the guy who's a forgetful one is the forgetful hearer who just hears only but doesn't do the Word. That it shows you that one who forgets the covenant of the Lord is one who hears the Word only but doesn't do it. All those people that don't do the word are essentially have forgotten the covenant of the Lord because they're not a doer of it. They're called a forgetful hearer. God expects us to do his word. He expects us to walk in line with the covenant. Another thing that we see is it speaks of those who were transgressing the covenant. We cannot be transgressing the covenant and see, think that we're going to see God's blessings come forth in our life or see him manifest in any way. Joshua chapter 7, verse 11. He said, Israel has sinned, and they've also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. It means any time we've sinned, we transgress the covenant. That's why we've got to conquer all areas of sin in our life. For they've even taken of the cursed thing, and have also stolen, dissembled also, and they put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. When we have sin active in our life, we cannot stand before the enemies. You're giving place to them. They're going to come in and bring destruction against you. Turn their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. You are cursed. The covenant has blessings and it has curses. When we obey, blessings come. When we disobey, curses come. Sin is disobedience and that brings curses. He even says, neither will I be with you anymore except you destroy the accursed from among you. The accursed things had to be destroyed. This guy had to be eliminated because there was no remedy for it in the Old Testament. And he did. Achan got killed. Same time, in the New Testament, we can confess our sins, receive forgiveness, cleansing from all unrighteousness, have a godly sorrow that works repentance, and not turn away from it, and, or not, not continue in it, but turn away from it and walk in it. And we can come back into walking in the ways of the Lord, of course. We're in a better covenant with better promises, praise God. Judges chapter 2, verse 20. We cannot be transgressing the covenant. It says, The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He said, Because that this people has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened to my voice. Not obeying God's voice is transgressing his covenant. You've got to realize it's not just why well, I just didn't do what God told me to do. It's more than that. We've actually transgressed the covenant that we have with him. And then what was the result? I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. Otherwise, that's the ites. 
which means the type of all the evil spirits. If you transgress the covenant, walk in sin, you're not going to get any deliverance anymore in your life until you come in line. That's why the prerequisite for deliverance is always confession of sin, true repentance, godly sorrow, and we turn away from it. And if we go back into sin, what's going to happen? We're going to be in worse shape. We know we're going to get seven more wicked than himself. We'll be in worse shape. That's why we cannot walk in sin. Also, even the guy, if he walks in sin, remember the guy who got healed at the pool of Bethesda and Jesus said, found him in the temple and said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come on you. We'll be in worse shape. Therefore, we must not break or transgress the covenant by walking in the ways of sin. He wants us to put sin underfoot. And you are well able to do it because you are dead to sin and alive unto God, and sin has no dominion over you any longer. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 11. It speaks of the king of Syria did carry away Israel unto Syria. They went into captivity and put them in these places where they were in captivity. Why? Verse 12 tells, Because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant. And all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, and would not hear them nor do them. That means any time that we will not obey God's word, again, we're transgressing the covenant. And what happened to these guys? They went into captivity. Why are people in captivity today? Because of sin. Why have these curses come upon us? Because of sin. Remember, all of us are affected, especially from the inherited generational curses. The iniquities of the fathers are visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation. You have those spirits in you from day one. And then anything else that's happened in your own life from sins or victimization is added fuel to the fire, so to speak. This is why deliverance is mandatory to cast out all these spirits and drive them all out. And also obedience to the Lord. We cannot be transgressing the covenant of the Lord by disobedience and think that we're not going to walk and think that we're going to come out of bondage. No, we're going to be in captivity. In fact, quite a statement is made also in regards to the judgment that is going to come in the end. Isaiah 24, verse 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Why? Because they transgressed the laws. They changed the ordinance. They've broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, or the age abiding, remember this talks about age abiding covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth. It's going to be. There's going to be a curse. It's going to destroy the earth. So many things are going to be destroyed, remember. In Revelation, the fish are going to be destroyed. The trees are going to be burned up. The grass is going to be burned up. An earthquake is going to happen. The places are going to be leveled. It's going to be a whole different thing when Jesus comes and operates in the millennial reign. It's going to look totally different. They that dwelt therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men left. That's what's going to happen, except for those that are righteous. We're the ones who are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to be protected during the time when judgments are beginning to happen. And before the final judgment there at Armageddon and the real destruction comes, then, of course, we are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. You must understand the great tribulation judgment, what's coming there, is judgment for breaking covenant with God. All this destruction is going to happen. Remember also that there is a a judgment that is going to come upon the church, the church as well. Remember, that's going to happen first before the end. In Hosea chapter 8, verse 1, it says this, Set thy trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord. What's the house of the Lord? That's the church. We are a part of the house of the Lord. Jesus, the cornerstone. You and I are living stones in the house of the Lord. Why is this going to happen? Because they've transgressed my covenant. You can't transgress God's covenant and think that things are, you're not going to see repercussions and trespassed against my law. Israel, which is a type of the church because we are the Israel of God now. Remember in the New Testament, the Israel of God is those who are the Jews inwardly on the inside, which is the church. Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. Otherwise, they don't understand why these things are happening. They should understand, but obviously they haven't understood what the word says. And they're thinking that nothing should happen just because of the fact that they are born again. Israel has cast off the thing that's good, which is what? The Word. They didn't walk in line with the Word. They didn't walk in line with the covenant. As he says back here, 
they transgressed the covenant and trespassed against my law. This is why being a hearer and a doer of the word is absolutely essential to walk in covenant relationship with God. Notice what happens. They cast off the thing that's good. The enemy shall pursue them. That's the devil. The devil will come when we open the door from sin and destructive things will happen. It's not God's not bringing it. The reason it happens though is because God's word is set what, how things happen. If you obey, you're blessed. If you disobey, you're cursed. Satan's the accuser of the brethren that accuses before God of our sins, giving them a legal right according to spiritual law to be able to come in and to pursue and bring destruction. And that's what is going to happen. Those ones that will walk with him, they're going to be the ones protected, but the ones who don't, they're going to be the ones that are going to be the fallaway group, and they're going to see a lot of destruction. Make sure you are walking in line with the Word of God 100%. We see further where it speaks of those who transgressed the covenant. Matthew chapter 15, verse 3. He answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? That's quite a statement. If we have false traditions, which are not of God, we're actually transgressing the commandment of God, which would be transgressing His covenant, because that's what we're supposed to walk by, the commandments. This is why anybody that has traditions of men out there, they're in trouble. They're going to see destructive effects coming upon them. That's why we need to get the exact precise, correct Word of God, so we walk right before the Lord. All these people that have traditions of men, commandments of men, they're in trouble because they are transgressing the things of, of God. Also, if you have come out of something that is not of the Lord, and you go back into things that are, are of the, now that are not of the Lord, again, you're in trouble. Galatians 2.18, if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Otherwise, God delivered you out of something, but you went back into it. And in this case, the Galatian church, you know, God had brought them out of the Old Testament, the law, the law was changed, the covenant was changed, everything was changed, and they went back into the Old Testament law that God had delivered them out of, which was a mistake, instead of following in the way of the New Testament. He said, if I build again the things which I destroyed, Paul's telling him, I make myself a transgressor. I would be transgressing the covenant if I go back into anything. You cannot go back and think that you will not see repercussions. We also see in 2 Peter chapter 2, similar type of a statement here, where it says in verse 20, If after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, and how did we do it? Through the precise, correct knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because we got the Word and we walked in line with it. If, it says, they are again entangled or involved in, therein, went right back into those things that they got delivered out of, and overcome, they be, or went, now they become involved in these again, and, and the de devil's got them back into these evil things, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now, that's the same kind of thing. Seven more demons coming in. You know, you're going to be in a worse shape, like we saw in John 5, 14 we mentioned, showing the fact that if God has delivered you out of things, do not ever go back into the things that you have once been in. Otherwise, you are going to be in worse shape. We see over in 1 Timothy, we have to understand that any time we walk in any kind of sin, whether you know it or not, you're in the transgression, transgressing the covenant. Look what it says here in 1 Timothy 2.14. It's talking about Adam and the woman. The Adam, was, Adam was not deceived. He knew what he was doing, so obviously he was sinning. But the woman, being deceived, she didn't know because she was deceived, yet she was in the transgression, even if she didn't know it. That means if we're deceived and we're walking in wrong ways, we're still going to be in the transgression. We still have transgressed the covenant. We're still going to see the ramifications or the effects, that is, the, the consequences of that in our life. We can see this even from a scripture in the Old Testament that shows Le Leviticus 5.17, if a soul sins and commits any of these things that are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist 
This is an old English word, and it means to know. Though he knows it not, it's like he's deceived. He didn't know about it, or he's ignorant of it. Yet is he guilty, and he shall bear his iniquity. So whether we walk in sin, whether we know, when we walk in sin, whether we know it or not, we're still transgressing the covenant. That's why we've got to get the knowledge of God. We cannot plead ignorance. That doesn't work. Spiritual law is spiritual law. We need to know the word and walk in line with it. And to think that maybe we'll escape these things, no, it won't happen. You transgress the covenant, you're going to have effects. Hebrews 2.1, Therefore we ought, or this means we must, it's necessary, to give the more earnest heed to the things that we've heard. We need to really take heed to what we're hearing, lest at any time we should let them slip. That means you're supposed to hold on to all these things. This is the covenant responsibilities that we have. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience, transgressing against the covenant, disobeying the word, received a just recompense of reward. Otherwise, you know, they saw the penalty. They didn't get away with it. How shall we escape? Well, we're, God's not going to do that for us. Oh, we're not going to escape. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It doesn't change. We are not going to escape. He expects every one of us to do what is right in the sight of the Lord. You know, if we even come down to Hebrews chapter 10 <clears throat> and verse 26, remember that sin has no dominion over us anymore. And if we know that something is sin, look what it says in Hebrews 10, 26. If we sin willfully, after we've received the knowledge, the precise correct knowledge of the truth, there remains no sacrifice for sins to get out of this thing, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment, fire or indignation will devour the adversaries. This is covenant. This is not God being unfair. This is covenant relationship. When you obey, blessings will come. When you disobey, transgress the covenant, then these destructive things, judgments will come. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy. At least in the New Testament, we have mercy now. We can confess our sin and he'll be merciful and forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we meet the conditions. But they died under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, he says, though, that's quite a statement. Suppose you thought he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. That's essentially what we've done if we disobey the word and transgress the covenant. And counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an holy thing, or really this means a common thing. This is the word koinos, which means common, talking about like the, the Greek is written in common, koine, koine Greek, which is common Greek. Like it's a common thing, it's no big deal. Oh, the blood of Jesus is a holy thing. Jesus shed his blood in order to accomplish redemption and to provide us to be reconciled unto God and to walk uprightly before him and to be cleansed. And also has done despite, which means insult, under the spirit of grace. So if we walk in sin, we're essentially trotting underfoot Jesus. We think the, the, like, right, treating it like the blood is no, nothing at all. And we're doing insult to the spirit of grace. No, we're not going to get away from that. And we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the, judge, the Lord shall judge his people. We must understand this aspect of the covenant. We talked about the good things that he wants to accomplish, many of the things today. How he wants to bring increases and abound and see all these great blessings. Well, we also have to understand if we don't walk in it, there will be a judgment that comes. Fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Furthermore, when we carry out the will of God, we cannot have respect to persons. James 2.9 says, If you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors, meaning we have transgressed the covenant. And we will get ramifications or some kind of effects from it. Well, you know, aren't, aren't going to get out of it. We even see it's very clear what causes a transgression of the law, speaking of the law of the New Testament. 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. That's why 
Sin has no dominion over you. You are not to yield yourself to sin. You're to strive against sin. You're to overcome and conquer. Because that's the way the devil gets place in your life when he gets you to sin. As long as you will walk in the ways of the Lord, you can be protected. And the enemy will not be able to get to you if you will walk uprightly. And then there's quite a statement here. This is a very strong statement, but it is the truth about the effects of transgressing the law. 2 John 1, 9. Whosoever transgresseth, means they're not walking in line with the word, and abides not in the doctrine of Christ, they're not abiding it, they're not walking it, they're not continuing it. Hath not God. That's quite a statement. This literally, because this word here, is a present tense verb, is essentially saying, is not having God. God's not doing anything in their life. It's like they don't even have God. He that abides continually in the doctrine of Christ, he has, he's having both the Father and the Son. And they're going to manifest yourself. So transgressing the covenant is a very serious thing. If you will abide in the Word and walk in the Word, you will not transgress the covenant. You will walk in His ways, you will have the Father and the Son, and you will be blessed. And that's what God wants to bring forth. We cannot be breaking the covenant, see? And he speaks about how these ones that were breaking the covenant back in the Old Testament. Some people think, well, I didn't think I could break covenant now in the New Testament. Sure you can, by not walking in line with the word of the covenant. Leviticus 26, 15, If you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, that you will not do all my commandments, what happens? But that you break my covenant. Not doing his word is breaking the covenant from God's standpoint. I mean, if God, suppose he decided not to do his word, he'd break his covenant, wouldn't he? Well, how about when we don't do the word? Well, it doesn't, well, it doesn't matter for us. Huh? No. If that would break the covenant for God, us not doing the word would break the covenant for us. We cannot be breaking the covenant. We cannot give place to it. See, this is the problem, what happened with them in the Old Testament. Uh, they were on, you know, walking in God's ways for a little short time, and then they turn away time and time again. Deuteronomy 31, verse 20. He said, For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers that flows with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves in wax and fat, then they will turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. What's that show you? They were eaten and they filled themselves. They got fat on all these blessings that God had brought. Don't ever let yourself take God for granted. Or when you see blessings that now, well, I just got, I don't really need God, you know. It's kind of like the Laodicean guys, you know. Hey, we're, we're increased, we have riches, we have need of nothing, everything's fine. Oh, he said, you're miserable, you're blind, you're wretched, you're poor, you know, you're in terrible shape. They turned up to other things and didn't serve the Lord. They served other things and they broke covenant. The Lord expects you to put him first place all the days of your life and do everything that he wants you to do. Remember, God will not break his covenant. Well, then how could we ever be justified breaking our part of the covenant? It won't work. Judges 2, 1. Remember the last part of this? He said, I said, I will never break my covenant with you. God will never break his covenant. He will absolutely bring it to pass for sure. And we see it also in Psalms 89. Psalms 89. Psalms 89, verse 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. See, when you understand this, you understand God is faithful. He is faithful to perform His word. He will never break His covenant. He will always bring these things to pass. He is faithful, and you can absolutely trust in Him. Well, He needs to see that we're faithful, too. Remember the ones who come back with Jesus in Revelation 17, 14? The called, the chosen, the faithful. Because that means we've been faithful to the covenant. We have responded to the call, been a doer of it, and we are showing ourselves to be faithful. That's what God's looking for. See, that was what about Abram. Why did he choose Abram? Because he found his heart faithful, it says. God's looking for those who will be faithful, who will carry out the covenant and be a doer of the word of God. 
And that is so important. He wants you to put the word first place in your life. What's going to happen if we don't walk in the ways of the Lord? We're going to see curses come. Is that, of course, that, is that what God wants? No. He wants you to choose the right path. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26, he says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. God has set. You can, watch, you can walk either way. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. That's someone who's keeping covenant, walking in line with the covenant. You're going to get blessed, and those blessings are going to come on you. But then he also says, a curse, if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. That's the way a covenant works. A covenant has blessings and curses. It does not have blessings only. <laughs> if you think that, it's a fallacy. No, it has repercussions for it. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you've not known. That's disobedience. We cannot be disobeying the word of God. And we see also, again, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, down here in verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. That means it, it carries on to your seed because that inherited generational effect is going to come into them from the things that you have done. So, God set before us life and death. Of course, what's he tell us? He says, choose life, of course. Choose the way of blessing so you can see it come to pass. This means you and I have a free will. And he, we, can set, we can choose what happens in our life. God doesn't make us robots. The, law, the teacher says, well, you're, everybody's predestined to certain things. We're all predestined to walk in the ways of the Lord because that's what God has for everybody. But certain ones aren't predestined and they're going to be saved and the other one's not going to be. That's a line teaching from the devil that has gone forth in the body of Christ. Every single one of us has a free will to choose. He wants you to choose life. You choose the life, then you're going to see great things happen. Will curses come upon you if you don't walk in wrong ways? If you walk in the ways of the Lord, are curses going to come upon you? No, they're not. Because Proverbs 26, verse 2, this is truth and spiritual law. The latter part of the verse says, So the curse causeless shall not come. There is a cause for every curse. You have to understand that. Don't think, I wonder why these things are happening to me. I wonder why this has happened. There is a reason. And a curse comes because of sin. The curse causes, and the curse is anything. It's destructive, sickness, disease, poverty, all kinds of calamities, and so forth. It's always a cause for it. It might be inherited generational iniquity curses from the sins of the forefathers. A lot of things are or sins that you committed at other times in your life that you didn't deal with, or the effects of them now, or being victimized in life in some way. That's why you want to discover all of the things that have occurred, all the iniquity roots, so you can come out of the captivity. That's why you need to take note that you need to discover all the things that are in you. Lamentations 2.14, talking about the prophets. Oh, they, were, they were telling them the wrong thing. The prophets have seen vain, vain and foolish things for thee. They've not discovered thine iniquity. That's what they should have done. They were telling a bunch of good things, you know. we got the same thing going on today. A lot of prophets, you know, prophesying over the, all these kind of things. Instead of telling them their iniquity and showing them what to do to overcome. They didn't discover the iniquity to turn away thy captivity. They saw all these false burdens and causes of banishment, things that weren't even the truth. You want to make sure that you are discovering the iniquity roots so you can turn away the captivity because that's what's let the evil spirits come in so that you'll know what spirits to cast out and get delivered and get set free from them. Curses will come. We see this even from the very beginning. Remember, even what happened to the serpent. The Lord God said in Genesis 3.14, The serpent, because thou hast done this, you are cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. The curse is upon him, and it's been upon him always. Man was cursed as well. So is the woman here. He said, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow you'll bring forth children, and your desire to be to your husband, he shall rule over thee. To Adam... 
He says, Because you hearken to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow you'll eat of it all the days of your life. Curses came because of sin. Came also on the earth. This is why we have to make sure that we are only involved with things that are of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 25 and 26, he says, The graven images of their God shall you burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that's on them. You're not going to go sell them and make some money off of it. Nor take it unto thee, lest thou be ensnared therein, for it's an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shall thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. You should not bring anything that is idolatrous into your house. But thou shalt utterly detest it, utterly abhor it, for it's a cursed thing. If you have accursed things with you, then curses will come upon you. You can have curses come because of accursed objects that are idolatry. That's why you cannot have these kind of things. It's like I remember the time the one guy was a minister, and he was wondering why he was having all these problems. He was having insomnia. He couldn't sleep. He was getting woke up. He had all these problems going on, and he had some just mental problems that were occurring. And his brother had sent him a tiki god, nice little souvenir, you know. And instead of getting rid of it, he kept it and he put it on his dresser. <laughs> he thought it wasn't any big deal. He didn't understand. Until he got rid of that thing and burnt that and destroyed that, he had nothing but problems because the demons were operating through it. You can't have any cursed object. I don't care who gave it to you. If it's idolatrous or a symbol of false worship, you need to get rid of that thing. Get rid of it. Don't allow those things to, to be upon you. We see in Deuteronomy, have them in your house. 29, verse 19. It shall come to pass when he heareth the words of this curse. This is because of the fact that he was walking in sin. Though he bless himself in his heart, saying, Well, I'm going to have peace. Though I walk in the imagination of mine heart to add drunkenness to thirst. That's the guy that says, Well, I'm just going to make a good confession and I'm not going to have any problems. And if you've got demons that have come in from sin in the past, your confession isn't going to get rid of them. You're going to have to, get, you're going to have to cast these spirits out and get rid of it. Of course, you're going to have to repent. He's saying, well, I won't have any effects of these things. No, you will have effects of them until you confess the sin, have a true godly sorrow that works repentance, and you're also going to have to cast out the demons to get rid of them so that they will not continue to work against you. He said the Lord will not spare them. This is the guy who won't repent. Then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. All the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. <laughs> ah, you don't deal with these things. That's the end result. You get blotted out. Look what it says in Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. You confirm the words of the law in your life, would be the law of Christ in the New Testament, by doing them. Remember, not just being a hearer only, by doing them. Otherwise, if we don't do the word, we're cursed. It doesn't matter whether you know it or whether you don't know it. It all matters whether you're putting it in operation and carrying out the word of God. Deuteronomy 28 Verse 1, it shall come to pass, if thou wilt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings will come on you and overtake you. That's a, that's a promise of the covenant. If thou hearken, shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, that's the condition. Doing what God says, being obedient, will bring blessings coming on you and overtaking you. If they come on you and overtake you, you can't even get away from them. You don't say, oh, well, why these blessings aren't coming? Well, there must be a reason why. But if we're doing what he says, the blessings will come and get you. They'll overtake you. But then he comes down to verse 15. It shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, all these curses shall come on thee and overtake thee meaning you can't get away from the curses. They will come on you just as well. God wants us to understand that you and I 
are to walk in line with the word of the covenant to see God's blessings come upon us. Now, when you walk in disobedience, you open the door for the enemy. And Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us before God night and day of what? Of our sins, giving him a legal right to bring curses of destruction upon us and to enter in and cause problems. You must understand, that's how what happens. He's the one who brings these destructive things. While we're talking about these curses, it's important to realize also, Deuteronomy chapter 28, it lists all these curses out after verse 15. And some of the ones it speaks of are like physical ailments. Here's an example in verse 22. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, with a fever, with inflammation, with extreme burning, with sword, blasting. And there's all these different ones where it speaks of, of it appears that the Lord is smiting you. Here's verse 27. I will, the Lord will smite thee with a botch of Egypt and emeralds and scab and the itch wherever you can't be healed. Has God bring all the sickness and disease on all of us? No, the devil does it. Why does it say what it says? Well, you have to understand that the English translations have translated these verbs in a causative means for the subject. Otherwise, the Lord will smite like he's causing it, like he's doing these kind of things. But this is a mistake because these verbs that are in the imperfect mood in the Hebrew, it can denote a, when it's in certain situations, a potential or permissive action of the verb, not causative. What it means is that it's not saying necessarily that the Lord will cause such and such, but he will permit these things to happen. And this is especially when we see that there is what's, you don't know Hebrew, but it's when it's in a jussive state, when it has a particular thing called a, a comet's hay, which is at the end of a word in the Hebrew, when it does not have these, it's in what's called the jussive state, which means the verbs can be permissive. And uh, this has also been brought out by Robert Young. We've talked about Young's translation and how he's done such a good job. Well, he wrote a book called Hints and Helps to Bible Interpretation, and he points out the fact that in this that the verbs are, these ones in these cases, are permissive action, not causative action. So that's important for you to understand, because don't think that God is doing these things. He permits it. Why does he permit it? Because his word is so. Otherwise, you, you will disobey. It's going to happen. He's going to permit his word to be carried out. Who is doing the destruction? The enemy is doing the destruction. A good scripture even to show you this that we already looked at, but we'll just look at it again for a moment. Look what it says back here in Hosea chapter 8. Remember, they transgressed the covenant. They trespassed the law. They're crying out, saying, we know you. He says, they cast off the thing that's good. What happens when you transgress the covenant or you disobey, which is what all talks about the curses come from disobedience? The enemy shall pursue them. Why? Because the door is open. See, the devil will come after you because he's the accuser of the brethren and God honors, of course, spiritual law. The Bible says, you obey, blessings come. You disobey, curses will come. And who's bringing these curses? It's the devil who's bringing them because of the open door of sin, and he will bring destructive things. This is why, so you understand that God's not the one who's bringing these things. I mean, he's not putting a sickness on you one minute and then turn around to heal you the next minute. No, it's the devil who's bringing the sickness and disease. God is the healer of all of these things. We also see in Jeremiah chapter 11, Curses will come, as it says in verse 3. Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. That's the way it is. If we don't obey, curses are coming. That means God expects, that's why the guy who's a hearer, but he's not a doer, he deceives himself. He thinks he's okay. And yet he's wondering why all these curses are coming or why the blessings aren't coming and he's having all these problems. Because he's not a doer. We're not doing the word, we're not obeying it, and then curses will come upon a person. Over in Psalms, what else is going to bring curses upon us? 
And there's many things. We're just going to look at a few important things. Psalms 119, verse 21. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Anytime you're not walking according to the word, you're essentially walking according to self, which is walking in pride. We cannot have pride. Pride brings a curse. That's what happened. Remember, Satan, he was prideful. I will. He wanted all the things that he wanted. I will, I will, I will, I will. Remember the five I wills. Pride got a hold of him. He was he lifted up because of his beauty, he lifted up, you know, because of his brightness that he had and the wisdom he had and all these things. Pride got a hold of him. And, of course, he's cur he was cursed. He erred the commandments. He disobeyed God. And iniquity was found in him. Of course, that cost him. He's finished for good, Turn, turned over to uh, his destiny, which is being an everlasting fire. Look what it says in Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, verse 33. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. It's the result of them walking in the ways of disobedience. But he blesses the habitation of the just. That's the righteous. And who are the righteous? The ones who are doing the word of righteousness, who are born again, walking in his ways. God wants you to walk in his ways, and then you will see the blessings come upon you. But the ones that are walking wrong, don't notice. Notice it says it's in the house of the wicked. It'll affect everybody in the house. We've talked about this in the past. Household blessing and household curses. Household blessings and household punishment curses will come on the whole house. Remember what happened when Korah rebelled against Moses and Aaron? <clears throat> when they <clears throat> all came out there, they opened up. Who all went down in the pit? Not just Korah, but the whole family, the whole group went down. The curse came upon the whole group. God will bless the habitation of the just, but the curse of the Lord will be in the house of the wicked. This is why, of course, we've got to make sure that we are walking in the ways of righteousness at all times. Here we see a contrasting statement showing you what happens when you obey and what happens when you disobey. Jeremiah 15, 17, verse 5. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and makes flesh his arm. He's doing everything his own strength. He's doing everything his own way, however he wants to do it. And these people that say, well, I'm not going to do the word. I'm doing it my way. Even if you're doing spiritual things, you know, well, I'm casting out demons my way by interrogating demons because that's what I want to do. You're cursed. <laughs> you're not doing it the right way. You're doing it a false way. You're doing it a wrong way. Cursed be the man that trusts in man, makes flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. Anytime we do it our way instead of God's way, we're in trouble. Our heart is actually departed from the Lord. We're cursed. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh. He's wondering, where's all the good things? He won't be able to see it. It's not going to be coming. And shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. You know, when salt, which is part, it can be for blessing or for judgments. You're in a salt land, what does it do? It just kills everything. It can't produce anything anymore. They salted the city, remember, and it couldn't do anything. It was finished. It was done. Not inhabited. Couldn't inhabit it any longer. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. Ah, this is one who is trusting him, obeying him. He shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, shall not see when heat cometh. Not, they're going to have those problems. Leaf shall be green, shall not be careful in the year of drought. They shall never, neither shall cease from yielding fruit, even in the time of drought. It might be all going crazy all around the world, but God's blessings upon you, because you are walking in the ways of the Lord. Remember, when the curses we talked about before in Exodus, that were coming upon them, the curses came on them, the hail came upon them, all the different curses that came, and yet in Goshen they were protected. Uh, no curses there, because they were walking in the ways of the Lord, even in the midst of the judgments that are going to come. And the judgments are going to come on the world don't be afraid. You're walking right, God will protect you. But if you're not walking right, you're going to get hit as well as everybody else. That's why we've got to walk 
have the fear of the Lord, walk obedient unto Him, not give place to any areas of sin. Look also what brings curses. Jeremiah 48, 10, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. Really this word more means slack and lax. That's why Young's brings it, I think, is better rendering of what this is talking about. The guy who does it slothfully. We're supposed to do everything with diligence with all of our heart. You can't do things half-hearted and think that that's going to make it. Well, I'll do enough just to kind of, you know, God will, he sees I'm doing something. No, you've got to do it with all your heart. You can't do it slothfully. You've got to do things right. You can't do your work at job on your job slothfully, or you're going to get fired, won't you? You've got to do it right, and you've got to do it, and you've got to be diligent to carry things out. Also, cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. What's when they went out, they had to smite their enemies. Well, how's that apply to us? The person will be cursed if they won't enter into spiritual warfare to conquer their enemies. That means anybody who's not entering into spiritual warfare, warfare intercession, warfare in deliverance, taking dominion over the works of the enemy, destroying the enemies, putting your sword in operation, you're going to be cursed. Because you and I are expected to war good warfare, fight the good fight of faith. He wants us to go and to cast out all the demons. He wants us to cast down all these spirits from the heavenlies and destroy the works of the enemy. You and I are expected to carry out what He called us to do. Remember, we are His uh, intercessors, and the intercessor is to have the garments of vengeance to repay fury to His adversaries, a recompense to those ones that were, e were evil, that bring destruction. Otherwise, God uses us to bring, the, bring the, the recompense upon them because we are going to speak forth to release Him to do these things. Otherwise, you've got to engage in spiritual warfare. If not, you're going to be cursed. That's disobedience, isn't it? Not carrying out the things that God's called us to do. Daniel chapter 9, verse 11, he said, he knew why they were, had problems. Yea, all Israel transgress thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Remember, sins are not only sins of commission, but they're also sins of omission. Remember what it says in James 4, 17, He that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Well, that would be someone who might not obey the voice. Well, I didn't do anything wrong. I just didn't do what I was supposed to do. Well, it's still sin. Therefore, the curses poured upon us. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, you see, they were under an oath in the covenant, just like you and I are, the same thing. What's happened? Because they sinned against him by not obeying the voice of the Lord, transgressing the law of God. We need to do everything that he tells us to do. We see another thing that's important, and it's amazing how many Christians have fallen for the lying teaching, thinking that tithing isn't for today, or it was of the law, and it's not for today in the New Testament. <laughs> it's amazing. Malachi 3.8, Will a man rob God? Yet have you robbed me. He said, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and in offerings, because the tenth belongs to him. You're cursed with a curse, for you've robbed me, even this whole nation. You've robbed God, and you've also robbed, robbed the nation, which is what? The church, the holy nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I'll not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out some bl blessing, there shall not be room enough to receive. When you bring what belongs to God to Him, He will multiply that back to you, and He will bring blessings even such that you can't outgive God. You know, you bring the tithes and offerings to Him, He will give back to you with a blessing there's not even room enough to receive. It will be abundance. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He will not destroy the fruits of your ground. You aren't going to see the destruction come. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. Every, you're going to prosper in everything that you do when you walk in line with the Word. All nations shall call you blessed. You shall be a delightsome land. Anybody that tries to tell you that tithing is not for the New Testament, you show them Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8. Here, men that die receive tithes. Talking about someone who's receiving, like in a service, and an offering, or whatever. But there... He receiveth them of whom it's witnessed that he liveth. Who is the only one who is witnessed that he liveth in the scripture? The one who's been raised from the dead, alive forevermore, 
Jesus, where is there? Heaven, where he's at. That tells you the fact that the tithes are received by Jesus in heaven. It is New Testament. Those people that do not tithe are cursed with a curse, and destruction will come upon them. You and I need to be doers of the word in all aspects. See, God wants to bless us, and if we'll do the things that he tells us to do, we'll see the blessings. But, you know, we even see it over the New Testament. These guys that didn't carry out the things that they were supposed to do, they were in trouble. Matthew 25, 41. Then he shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed. They were cursed. And what did they end up into? Everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It was prepared for the devil and his angels, not for man, but men are going into it. Why? Because they're not following the covenant and they're cursed because they weren't doing what he said. What was the problem in this case? I was a hungry and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you took me not in. Naked and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer, saying, Lord, when saw thee we hunger, a thirst, stranger, naked, sick, or in prison, didn't minister unto thee? There, then he shall answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. Which means, if throughout your life you never one time minister to someone in these capacities, uh, you're going to be in trouble. God wants us to reach out and minister to people. This is why you minister to people that are hunger or thirst or stranger or naked or sick in prison to minister to their needs, to help them come out of it, minister the things of the Lord. The person that won't do that is going to be cursed and they're going to be in trouble. What does God want? He wants to bring blessings upon us. There's another aspect that we're going to talk about for a few minutes and that is the vengeance of the covenant. All these things we've been talking about today, tonight are really talking about the ramifications for people not walking in line with the Word. It speaks of, in Leviticus chapter 26, and these are things we have to know. If we walk in line with the Word, we won't see these problems happen. He said in Leviticus 26, 25, I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when you're gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence upon you and you shall be delivered in the hand of the enemy. Well, that's destructive things. And when it talks here about this quarrel, this quarrel is a word, not a good translation. It really means the vengeance. The vengeance of my covenant. Fifteen times and once avenge out of the 17 uses, one time quarrel, not a good translation. Young's, of course, corrects it with his consistency. He talks about the vengeance of the covenant, a vengeance for not carrying out the covenant. In fact, it's interesting. Back in Numbers, chapter 14, remember that he told them to go in and to search out the land and to come back and show if they got what fruit they saw and give a report on it, which they did, and they saw the fruit of the land, and then they were supposed to go in and possess it, and they didn't do it. Forty days they were to go and search out the land. Well, look what we see. It says happen in verse 34. Because of the fact that they didn't obey, he says, after the number of the days in which you searched the land, how long was it? Forty days. Each day for a year, meaning for every day that you went and searched out the land, there's going to be a penalty, a day for a year, 40 years. You shall bear your iniquities even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise, which was his vengeance against the covenant, against them who were in covenant relationship, because they breached, they breached the covenant which means he wasn't going to bring his promise to pass because of the fact that they had disobeyed. So instead, curses came upon them. We told you the same thing that happened to Israel. Remember, for 490 years, they did not obey the Lord in keeping the seventh year Sabbath. And so because of the 490 years, for every year that they had not done what God said, which was every seven years, 
So 7 into the 490 would be 70. 70 times 7 is the 490. Because of that, they had a punishment of 70 years of captivity. And what happened? They went to Babylon for 70 years, and they were in captivity. And then when they came out, they were supposed to continue to keep the, the, the seventh year Sabbath, you thought they would have learned after 70 years of captivity in Babylon, but they didn't, and they continued to do it. And we talked to you about the fact that when you do that, God will bring seven times more punishment. And we pointed out that out of uh, in Ezekiel was talking about that. We looked at that. For those of you who didn't see this, This was in Ezekiel chapter 4. This is where it speaks of the number of days that he would lie on the side but because of their iniquity, pointing out to the, cur the number of years that they were going to be judged. And he talks about the 390 days he was supposed to bear. The, this is for Israel. And then the next one was for the 40 days for Judah. That was, Israel was the northern ten tribes. Judah were the south, southern two. So we have, 300, we have the 390 plus the 40. So that's 430 days, which would be 430 years. That was really their punishment total. Well, they had served 70 of it. 430 minus the 70 was 360. Now, did they do what God wanted to do? No. Because of the fact that they didn't, and they continued to not keep it, they got seven times more curses that came upon them. You take the 360 remaining years times seven, and you come up with 2,520 more years, and we pointed out that from that point, that brought them up to 1948 when Israel became a nation again. God is a performer of His Word. There is a vengeance of the covenant because of disobedience. That's why the Israel never became a nation again until 1948. Not just because they finally became one. No, it's because of God's judgment that was upon them. And the same thing with Jerusalem, which got taken 19 years after they went into captivity. 19 years after 1948 it was 1967 when they recovered Jerusalem shows you that God does things exactly. He is a performer of His Word. This is the vengeance of the covenant, the fact that it's, everybody's going to have to come in line with what needs to be done, or else the covenant curses will come to pass. God didn't say something and then just kind of let it slide. No. Whatever He said is going to come to pass. And before we conclude, conclude tonight, let's cover a couple other things. There is a vengeance that is going to come in the end. Isaiah chapter 61, where it speaks of the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, speaking of Jesus. And it lists all the things that he was going to do, which was quoted over in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. And that ended up proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord, and then that was the end of it in Luke 4, 19. But this has another aspect added on to it. And the day of vengeance of our God. That's not in Luke chapter 4. What's this talking about? This is talking about the second coming when Jesus comes. In the first coming, He came to bring salvation. In the second coming, He's coming to bring judgment upon the nations. And as He's retaking back the earth, and he's going to bring the judgment on those that have transgressed the covenant, and it's the day of the vengeance of our God. And that's exactly what's going to happen. We see also, this is why you've got to come out of all the things that are under the Lord. You've got to come out of anything that's under the world system, which is the Babylonian system. Jeremiah 51, 6, flee out of the midst of Babylon. Deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. That's why you've got to be in the place of protection. You can't be walking in these ways. We actually see the Lord's vengeance. First, there was a vengeance that occurred 
when he brought judgment. We see in Luke 21, verse 22, when he wiped out the city. Remember when he talked about it, those in Judea were to flee in the mountains and, and they were to depart out of there because that's when the judgment came in 70 A.D. on Israel, on the Jews, on Jerusalem, on the temple that was going to be destroyed that Jesus had spoke forth. These be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe unto those with child, to those that gave suck in those days. Be great distress in the land and wrath upon the people. And they fall by the edge of the sword. They be led away captive into all nations. This is what happened in 70 A.D. And Jerusalem should be trodden down. The Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles, be fulfilled. So there was a destruction, and they were led captive unto all nations. We have to understand that there'll be an end time judgment, of course, that is going to come. God, in bringing this, many people have a problem with God being a judge. Look what it says in Romans 3, 5. If our unrighteousness commends the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteousness who takes vengeance? No, he's not. God forbid. Then how shall God judge the world? He judges the world in righteousness, doesn't he? And he is a righteous God who will judge unrighteousness. Those that are unrighteous won't go into the, the, city, the, the city of the New Jerusalem whatsoever. Only those ones who are righteous. In fact, when he does bring the judgments, look what it says is going to happen. 2 Thessalonians 1.8, In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, because they rejected him and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Two different groups. Those who didn't know God, because they rejected him and get, didn't get born again. And those who didn't obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, this is the judgment that is going to come. And we see, remember what it speaks of in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. Where's the judgment come first? To the house of God. If it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? Those that aren't obeying, they're in trouble. If the righteous scarcely are being saved, remember the word scarcely means with difficulty, not easily, because they have to conquer and overcome the enemies, which they're able to do, but you're going to have pressure coming against you from the enemy, and temptations and attacks will come but you're well able to overcome it. But you, you're not, it's not going to be no attacks from the enemy. No, you've got to overcome. If the righteous with difficulty and not easily are being saved, the present tense, ongoing action, where shall the ungodly and the sinner, or the one who's walking in sin, devoted to sin, the sinful ones appear? They're going to be finished. The judgment is going to come. You have to understand that God is a righteous judge. And he's going to do things that are right. You know, that's why we don't get involved in bringing retaliation. No, God's the one who does it outside of our intercession, being used of the Lord for God to bring vengeance against the evil spirit's work. But who's going to bring the judgment against Every, every, anything on the earth and against people. It's God. That's why it says in Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, and rather give place in the wrath, for it's written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. You don't have vengeance. You don't have retaliation. You don't come against people or anything. If the enemy hungers, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. So doing, you'll reap whole coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good, as it says. So you and I are not to avenge ourselves. God is the one who brings righteous vengeance. This is the vengeance of the covenant that will come. Those ones who rejected him, of course, are going to be cursed. But those ones who came into covenant and did not follow the way of the Lord, what's going to happen to them? They are going to see judgments come as well. This is why we have to understand a covenant. Now, we've covered a lot of things that might be considered somewhat negative in a sense, but nonetheless, they're important. 
There are blessings that come from the covenant and the promises of the covenant, which we're going to be talking about. We'll get into that on Wednesday. But we see if you forget the covenant, and how do you forget it? By not keeping the commandments, pride, idolatry, forgetting the word, forgetting wisdom and understanding, rejecting knowledge, rejecting his word, only being a hearer but not a doer. That's someone who is a forgetful one, forgetting the covenant of the Lord. If we transgress the covenant of the Lord, not obeying his voice, all these things, we're not going to stand against our enemies. You're not going to get any deliverance. You're going to be in captivity. You're going to see nothing but destruction coming. The enemy's going to pursue you. We saw all these scriptures. And this is why we can't have traditions of men. We've got to have the exact knowledge of the word. And if you go building the things that you once destroyed, you're going to be much, much worse. Seven more wicked will be coming. You will be in worse shape. Do not ever go backward. The one who goes backward is going to have a lot of trouble. We cannot be walking in any ways to sin, remember, whether we knew it or not. And the, the bottom line was that Second John 1, 9 about whoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ is not having God. That's a powerful statement. But that's a covenant statement, see. You have to understand that. It's not God in a personal way having an attitude. He didn't do things with an attitude. We don't do things with an attitude. That's all fleshy and wrong. He is doing things in righteousness. That's what we do as well. But those abiding in the doctrine of Christ are both having the Father and the Son. And we are going to see the blessings come forth. So we've covered a lot of important things tonight that, uh, about the curses that will come and why they come. And on Wednesday, we're going to continue on and we'll be talking about the blessings that will come, the promises that God wants to bring forth, the steadfastness of the covenant, and the things that you and I must do to see God bring the blessings upon us in our life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of the aspects of a covenant. I see that I cannot forget the covenant of the Lord or transgress against it, or break it. If I do, curses will come upon me. I thank you. I will be obedient to the word, or I will suffer the vengeance of the covenant, which is according to righteousness. I thank you, Lord. I am a hearer and a doer of the word. I will walk in the ways of righteousness. I put the word of God first place in my life, I will fulfill the covenant responsibilities that are set forth in the Word. And as I do so, then the blessings will come on me and overtake me. God will perform His covenant promises and blessings in my life. I put the Word first place. I understand that I have a covenant relationship. Therefore, I will walk in line with the word and I will not allow myself to break covenant transgress covenant turn away from it in any way I will abide in the doctrine of Christ and I will be continually having the father and the son all the days of my life in Jesus name amen praise God this is an important part tonight because even though it seemed like a lot of negative things being brought forth, well, we've got to understand that's all part of the covenant. So it really brings the fear of God for us and we see, okay, I've got to make sure I'm walking in line with the Word. I've got to know this Word. I, I can't be allowing sin to work in me. I can't be transgressing the covenant in any way. Or God, who's a righteous God, will be performing His Word. He, remember, He doesn't do things out of an attitude. That's why don't ever do anything out of an attitude. Or you're in the flesh and you're, making, you're sinning and making a mistake. You always do things according to the word in righteousness. Father, I thank you that we have ears to hear. We will be doers of the word. We thank you that we are going to walk in line with covenant. We understand covenant relationship as we're seeing all these scriptures. And we thank you. We're going to make sure that we walk in line with the word of the covenant and we fulfill the covenant responsibilities. And we thank you for then the promises and the blessings will come upon us in our life. Thank you for much fruit as we are hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Wednesday, we're going to...